I had just begun a long distance relationship. I was managing five staff. At that point, the most lucrative job that I was in. My dad would tell me constantly how proud he was. Eventually, I had a pretty serious panic attack at work. At one point, I was in this little alleyway, just hunched down on my knees and on my feet. I'm like, I think I'm about to die. I ended up developing an addiction to ADHD medication. I ended up developing chronic insomnia as well as a byproduct of that. And then developed an addiction to the medication to help me sleep. After I had that panic attack, I became a recluse. I literally didn't work for, for 18 months. My mind was pretty fried at that point. So at, at a certain point, I stopped taking Ritalin, but I was still taking Xanax because that was the only way I was able to go to sleep. And it wasn't until I met my teacher that things started to change. I was in a relationship for, for seven years with, with my daughter's mother. And obviously at the age of 18, none of us planned to have a child. She was my first love. When it happened, it didn't even occur to me that I had options. If I'm being really vulnerable and, and open right now, it just occurred to me that, okay, this is what we're doing. Like, how can I be a good father? And I wanted to be a good father and, and provide the way that my dad had. When I mentioned earlier on, like family was so important to our dynamic as a contra and as an identity for me and my family. And so I wanted to instill that. I wanted to be a good father and I tried everything to do that. And I feel really proud of who I was back then. A lot of messing up, but I had the foresight and I had some really good role models around me that showed me what a father could be like. And so I took responsibility and we stayed together for, for many years and we raised a really beautiful young woman now, but it was very hard. It was very hard. Like my friends were in college, they were partying, going out, taking drugs, nightclubs, and I would be home changing nappies on Saturday nights. And it never felt like I was missing out. But when we eventually separated, when I was around 23, 24, I realized how much I had missed out on in my life and how I had this yearning to explore and get to know myself. And so I did that. Well, prior to the news that you were having a child, right? What did you want to be? What did you see yourself becoming? How did you define success in the world at that 18 year old stage of life? Well, I knew the definition of success was equated with money and security. That was what was embedded into my psyche. It'd be a doctor or be a lawyer or be a businessman or be an engineer. And I remember my first love was to be a dancer. Like that quickly was not an option for my parents. My second option was to be a fashion designer. I don't know. And I'm like, I want to create beautiful fashion because I always had a real pension for, for clothing. And, and my mother sat me down and she said, no, you can't do that. Cause you know, how many people make money off that? And again, it was very narrow thinking, but this was how she was right as well. So I don't blame her for that. I didn't know what I was going to do. I just know I had to do whatever I did really, really well. And it was likely going to be in business because that was the most bad university degree I could get at the time. So I had my sights set on that. And then my final year of, of high school, obviously I had Taylor. And so I didn't end up going to college until many years later. I started working straight away. I started working at a bank, at a branch, actually, that was my first job. And it was humbling, but the motivation was now looking after a child. So um, be humble and work hard. So that was my motto at that point. Were you good at it? Working at a branch? Or was it literally know. just a means to an end? No, it was probably both. Like I never saw myself staying at a branch. Just platform yet a bank. But I ended up working at this bank for about eight, nine years, actually. Mm -hmm. And I was there for a while and I worked my way up actually to being a marketing director, which was a really pivotal moment in my life as well, knowing I could do that. But I loved people and I got to meet people a lot. I got to, to see people. I got to connect with people. I got to listen to people. I got to, to be human. I got to see different versions of people. So that part of my job was really fun. I can't say I had a very strategic mind at that age or I was very analytical, but I definitely enjoyed the other aspects of the role. Had you reached sort of a ceiling in terms of your 
growth in that industry? Is that why you went back to school? Because eight years is, is some significant experience. Yeah. I think very early on, I was really interested in marketing because I looked at, I looked at the bank and I was working for Australia's biggest bank at the point. And I'm like, what is the most creative job I could do? Right. And it was marketing and advertising, right? Because I do have a mind that's a lot more creative than it is analytical. And I was definitely not going to do financial planning or going to business banking or anything like that. It sounded cool. It was my motivation for going back to college and to doing marketing. And I ended up doing a master's in marketing and utilized that for a few years and then gave that up as well. Curious, what did you learn in the graduate program in marketing that you didn't know after eight, nine years of working in that banking position in marketing? I, I just learned, I think in the first semester that this is not who I wanted to be. This is not what I wanted to do. And I actually felt very depressed during that course because I'm like, well, what is my life? What am I going to do with my life if this is what I'm somewhat good at? I have a child to look after. I kind of resigned myself to the fact that, okay, well, this is my life. Like everyone doesn't get to choose. And yeah, I mean, thanks to that pro, I'm reflecting on that now. And that's what was there. I was like, okay, this is it. I guess I'll just see my days out working for the man. And I think it's similar to what a lot of probably our students come to us with these days. It's like, they don't realize the world is more expansive than we think it is. And I genuinely thought this would be my life and that's it. So I learned early on, it wasn't for me, but I stuck with it because I didn't think I had options. Well, it sounds like it's fit into the model of success that you had been indoctrinated into, but at the same time with the child and all that, your practices, your Buddhist practices fell by the wayside. And you mentioned that you would begin burning the candle at both ends. So talk about that moment of realization that this is not sustainable. That was when I was, uh, I completed my course and I was a marketing director at the time for an insurance company. And I had just begun a long distance relationship. I was managing five staff. It was the, at that point, the most lucrative job that I was in. My dad would tell me constantly how proud he was of how I turned my life around at that point. Um, and burning the candle at both ends really meant I was working really, really hard or working out really, really hard because I was obsessed with how I looked back then and me and all my friends would go to the gym after work, became a thing. And then we, because I was in the marketing and kind of finance world on Friday and Saturday nights, we would go and like smash ourselves. Like literally we would just drink and it was pretty gnarly how we would just do that week in and week out. And, and that became our version of release or fun. And it was pretty constant. And I was the youngest, obviously at this point, all the guys and ladies on my team were much older than me. And they were in their thirties, forties and fifties, and they were doing this too. And I'm like, okay, so bitch, this my life. Again, I would say that I mean, I'm in a job that I'm in a career that I'm not a hundred percent passionate about. And on the weekends, I go and drink and we have laughs, feel bad. And then I back it up the next week and this is it. I'm like, okay. And I didn't have. Again, another version of that, another version of what could be possible to see. So life was very one dimensional at that point. And eventually I had a pretty serious panic attack at work and leading up until that, I didn't think that I had anxiety. I knew I was stressed and I knew I was very internally conflicted about what I had chosen to do with my life, but I didn't think I had any sort of mental health issue. And back then in those years, we never spoke about mental health. If you had anxiety, there was something seriously wrong with you. He had even the mere mention of seeing a therapist. You were like, whoa, did you hear? Why not just seeing it? It was like that, you know, it's, it was wild. Um, but the panic attack happened one day at work and, um, it was very innocuous at the start. I came in and I had a coffee and my assistant came in, gave me a bunch of work and then just was looking at me really weirdly. And she's like, are you okay? And I'm like, yeah. I'm fine. And then she looked at me a few more moments and then left. And as soon as she left, I felt my hand started to tremor. I felt my heart beat really, really quickly. And 
almost instantaneous to thought it was just the coffee. But then I felt a swelling of emotion coming up and felt like I was about to cry in the middle of my office. And that really started it. I remember running out and I was walking through the CVD of Melbourne hyperventilating. At one point I was in the little alleyway, just hunched down on my knees and on my feet, just thinking I was about to die. And I called up my therapist at the time and I'm like, I think I'm about to die. And, and she's like, you better come and see me then. And I went and saw her, but she spent maybe 20, 30 minutes with me and said, I think you have ADHD. And, um, that was a diagnosis and then the prescription was medication. And that started a whole chain of events. I ended up developing an addiction to, uh, the, uh, ADHD medication. I ended up developing chronic insomnia as well as a byproduct of that and then developed an addiction to the medication to help me sleep. Uh, that moved into an eating disorder that moved into a whole host of other ailments that kind of accompanied me for about 18 months to two years. You and, saw um, a couple of other doctors as well to get second and third opinions and they all diagnosed yeah. you with something different, correct? Correct. Correct. Yeah. So, you know, one said I had depression. And I took SSRIs for about two weeks and then was just completely out of my body and stopped that. I went to a shamanic healer because I'm like, I can't hurt, you know, I'm trying all these different things. Uh, one said, I'm just stressed out and just the rest. And I don't say all of this to denigrate the, the profession at all. I think, you know, I've got a tremendous therapist right now that it's being a lifesaver. Um, but I also think back then we didn't understand a lot like we do now for sure and we tend to be oftentimes very um quick with uh, numbing and trying to fix the salute the, the problem instead of trying to really understand the, the problem hey really quickly if you like this content or if you don't like it let me know down in the comments because your likes and comments are going to help me learn what you want more of and then that way i can keep bringing you the good stuff all right thanks so much for your feedback and back to the show were you sneaking around doing, going to see these healers and doctors? Did your, did your drinking buddies on the weekend know that you were going through this uh, no, process? No, after, after I had that panic attack, I became a recluse. I didn't see any of my friends. I couldn't work. I literally didn't work for 18 months to two years. I was living off my savings. Uh, Does that mean you literally I, quit your job? You told them I can't come back yeah. to work? Yeah. Yeah. And they just said, okay? No, they were like, why and and you know tried to to get me to come back um but i, I just couldn't it is the reality like my mind was pretty fried at that point yeah I, I did go to different therapists and i probably wasn't as committed to one because intuitively i felt like this isn't right for me even the lady that i saw that gave me adhd i saw her for 12 months and the whole time i'm like i don't think i have this but then, you know, back then, well, what, what do I know? This lady's gone to college and skilled and highly recommended. And I'm just going to trust her. So yeah, that was the scenario for a long period of time. And then one day a friend had come to my house. At this point, my mother was actually looking after me. She flew back from Hong Kong to look after me because I was pretty sick. I was very skinny, wasn't eating, pretty sick. And this friend of mine's like, why don't you come and do a yoga class with me? And on my heart, I said, I don't own any Lululemons. I can't grow. That was it. And then it was like, no, no, but just come. You'll get a lot out of it. There's lots of girls there. At least worst case scenario, you can look at the girls. And it's such a stupid reason. But I said, yes. I'm like, okay, I'll go. I'll check it out. But he actually ended up taking me to a studio that was a Buddhist meditation studio. And this was the first time I'd really come back into contact with Buddhism for probably 10 years, maybe 15 years, maybe even a bit longer. And there was something really magical in that first moment when I saw my teacher, he walked into the room. He looked okay, at before we get to this part, because this is a mm. very juicy part of the story, <laughs> but I have some follow-up questions about your friend and the circumstances that you were in when your friend came around. So you were taking Xanax to go to sleep, which you developed an addiction to. You were on Ritalin during the day to stay awake which you were also addicted to. Your mom came in, you were living with your brother, I believe at a certain point, your dad was sending you money, right? This is all correct. At what point 
did you realize you were addicted or did someone around you say, man, oh, excuse me, you need to do something about this. This is not cool. No, I, I knew I couldn't really function. And the thing with those particular sub drugs is not that they, I didn't take them because it made me feel good. I literally had to take them, I had to take Xanax to fall asleep. And when I didn't sleep and there would be countless times where I would take a whole tablet of Xanax and not sleep. It was that bad, the insomnia. For me, I never took it recreationally to have fun and go out and party. It was just like, I can't actually function without these things. At a certain point, I stopped taking Ritalin, but I was still taking Xanax because that was the only way I was able to go to sleep and to wake up. And it wasn't until obviously, and we'll get to that part, I don't know, my teacher, that things started to change. But it also disassociated you from your body, which is something we all know now from hearing. As much of your story, you really don't like. So you can't tolerate it. And you started having suicidal ideations. What stopped you from taking that more seriously? Two things. One was my daughter. Just the idea of someone having to tell her was very heartbreaking for me. The other thing was that there was someone watching over me. And I didn't know, again, if it was Buddha or God spirit consciousness, but I'm like, there is a world outside of this. And I started pruning and I didn't know who I was pruning to. I remember at one point I was just like, every night I would go to sleep and just ask to be better and to look out and for life to look after my child and my family and my friends. Yet prayer became like a very central practice. Serene. So the reason I want to go deeper into this part of your story is I feel like a lot of people can relate to this, right? You feel burnt out. You may be reclusive and you may be having some suicidal thoughts. You may be depressed. So looking back at that period of your life with your mom, your brother, your dad around, right? And which is the benefit of coming from this sort of family oriented society and your daughter, who was an accidental addition to your life ended up inadvertently saving your life, possibly. Is there anything that you found that your associates or friends or your, even your family were doing that helped you in hindsight to get through this period? And is there anything that they were doing that may have been in unintentionally harming you more or saying during that time? Yeah, I think it's such an interesting question when you consider what it was like 16, 17, maybe 18 years ago versus now. I think now we have a lot more understanding around mental health and we talk about it more openly, right? It's not something that's riddled with shame when someone says that I'm anxious. It's almost your everyday vernacular now. That's a language. But back then it was very strange. And again, for immigrant families, you just don't talk about these things. It's like when I said I'm, I might be depressed. And I was like, what do you got to be depressed for? You've got everything you want. Like, snap out of it. Right. Snap out That's of it. And I don't blame them at all for that language because they never were educated on how to navigate that themselves, right? But I think what I experienced with my mother and subsequently my teacher was compassion. And that was really what began to transform my, my life. My mother and we have a love and hate relationship in the best of times, like I'm sure a lot of people do. She just came from Hong Kong where she was living. And just cook for me every day. A lot of the time I wouldn't eat because I just couldn't, but she would just cook for me every day. She'd make my bed every day. She'd just be there. And that is just tremendously precious and sweet. And it's the love of a mother, obviously a love of a parent. But just knowing that she was there in the house felt very healing. Prior to that, while I was going through a lot of these problems, I was living by myself. My parents were living in, in Hong Kong at the time. So just to have them around, just to know that someone was there caring for you was really special. And then later on, my teacher, for sure. Mm-hmm. Yeah, because 18 months is, is uh, significant. That's a significant amount of time. Like if you have a friend who's being reclusive for that long, there are few people who could be compassionate, you know, in that situation like that. Because eventually you would start to think, well, just, you know, come on, man, you're, you got everything, you know, you got so much to... But that's oftentimes the wrong thing to say if you're really trying to hold space for someone like that. So 
this friend of yours that eventually was successful in getting you out of the house, was he one of your old drinking buddies? Was he a new friend who was into like Buddhism? Like where did he come from and how did you, how did you know this person? Yeah, he was actually a very, very new friend that we had just vaguely crossed paths with. And it was on Facebook. He sent me a message and he's like, Hey, let's, let's go check out this, this studio. And he sent me a video of the studio and the video had my teacher who was a Sri Lankan man and he was young. He looked honestly younger than me. And I'm like, it's strange, but he had this really thick Sri Lankan accent and just the way he was speaking, there's something about it was very, it just spoke to me. And I felt at that moment, it's like coming home. Like I heard that accent. I saw this guy just talking about, you know, suffering and all these different elements of, of lives. And I'm like, ah, oh, this feels like it could be something really good. And the funny story is I actually messaged him on, on email and I'm like, help. These are all my problems. And I listed them all down. I didn't even know what came over me. I'm just, I just thought he should know. And again, up until this point, I thought it was a yoga studio. So maybe, you know, he thought like this posture would be good for me yesterday. And he replied back with just saying, I've been waiting for you. Come on Thursday. And, uh, how, how long did it take him to reply back to your message? About two hours. Wow. And, uh, and I, I, I assumed my friend had mentioned something to him, but I later found out he hadn't at all, but it was a very spooky, um, one of the many spooky things that I experienced with him, but I definitely think it was very karmic, our, our connection. And did your friend know you were going through all this emotional, psychological, spiritual problem? I think so. I, I think he assumed, um, I wasn't very good at talking about my feelings, mm -hmm. you know, and, uh, maybe a lot of people listening to this can relate. <laughs> Um, especially as men, but I wasn't very good at, at being open with a lot of my friends. Like I didn't explain to them the depth of what I was going through. I just said, you know, um, a lot of the time I was like, I'm just going through a lot, a hard time. You know, I'm just sick. Those would be some of the things that I would say. I would never really open up about what I was going through. And that was part of the problem in, in retrospect, right? Uh, but that was, that was my, my way of handling those things. It's just so interesting that this person you barely knew was able to intuit that this is something that could potentially help you and then was able to persuade you to come out of your cave and introduce you to this person. So let's cut to the studio. You meet your teacher for the first time and, and you were, you had mentioned the feeling you had, um, earlier. Could you just talk a little bit more about, about that? Yeah, I, I, I mean, I rarely believed in things like this prior to me experiencing it, but there was something really magical about seeing this teacher for the, for the first time in which I looked at him and I'm like, oh, I've seen you before. Yeah. Like you're just a very familiar feeling. And that didn't feel woo at the time at all, but. As we're going through the class, it quickly became evident that this was a normal yoga class. This was very much like Dharma talk and meditation and some gentle movements. It was like he was seeing into my experience and telling me exactly what I needed to hear. And the first thing is that, you know, suffering is inevitable. And I felt like I was hearing that again for the first time. Like, you know, he's like, we are all going to suffer in this life simply by being born. And I was like, huh, interesting. Um, then he's like, you know, don't identify with your suffering. And then it was like, you are not your thoughts. And when he said that there was something again, pretty incredible that happened. It was like, it snapped me out of a dream because at that moment I noticed I was having all of these thoughts and I became consciously aware of it. One thought was you're never going to get well again. Another thought was, you know, you're a terrible father. How are you going to make a living? What are you going to have for lunch? Like all of these random thoughts were going on. And I realized at that very moment, he said that, that I could observe these thoughts without actually becoming 
each thought. And up until that point, I was thrown around, yanked around by every thought that I had. And, um, and that was really interesting for me. And I think that was the hook that got me to come back the next day and the next day and the next day. Thank you so much for watching. Just FYI, we post a new video almost every day. So make sure you comment and subscribe below so you don't miss out on anything. And if you enjoyed this video, I think you're really going to love this one as well. And if you ever want to see a playlist of all of my podcasts or all of the plot twists or any other category of videos, you can find links to those in the description below.